Steve Cole. Now in this second module of Engineering Made Easy, I want to focus our attention on the load that we use during our design process. Now if we relate that back to our original formula, it is that actual load part of the equation that we're going to be talking about. In our industry, there are two engineering load conditions we look at. One is called a dead load, and the other is called the live load. Now, if we look at the dead load, it's fairly obvious that it's a load that remains there for the duration of the building life. It would be an example of, say, a roofing load, a flooring material load, or a ceiling load. It's classed as a static load and does not move or change during the life of that building. So let's now look at the live load. Although this may differ from the load definitions in AES NZS 1170, for the purpose of this video, I am classing the dynamic loads of wind, snow and earthquake under the category of a live load definition. Now we mentioned before in some of the previous modules, the standard called AES NZS 1170. That's the one the engineers use to establish these particular loads. So let's have a closer look at these loads. There are two main values we use. One, a total load. In other words, the physical weight of an object. Now that could well be a roof weight, a hot water cylinder, or maybe a heavy door. Now in our industry, we express these in either kilograms or kilonewtons. Now we all know what a kilogram is. A kilonewton is simply 100 kilograms. The other load value we use is a load per area. Now we express this as a kilopascal, which is a kilonewton, or 100 kilograms, per square meter. Typically, it'll be spread evenly over a large area. For example, it could be your roof load, it could be a floor load, snow load, or wind load. Now I'd like to have a closer look at how we actually establish these dead and live loads. In the case of the dead load, which as we said before, could either be in the form of maybe your roofing material, your ceiling material, or your flooring material, they're quite easy to establish. We simply either weigh them, or we look at our product specifications and see what the weights are. Now when we come to do our live load though, it's rather more complicated. Now the live load could be in the form of maybe a wind load, a snow load, or an earthquake load. Let's have a look at how we actually establish the value of a wind load. We start off first with a prevailing wind speed value, which is provided for us in AS NZS 1170 standard, depending on the location within New Zealand. We then look at the factors around the specific location of this building. We consider its coastal proximity, terrain conditions, building height, any sheltering provisions, along with any local wind speed conditions. A site wind speed is then determined and converted to give us a wind pressure, which we then use in our design process. Now this is expressed as a kilopascal. To easily categorise these wind loads, rather than quote a wind speed or wind pressure, NZS 3604 has broken it up into several different wind zones. Now we have our low wind zone, medium wind zone, high wind zone, a very high wind zone, an extra high wind zone. Now you'll notice there, say for example, on the very high wind zone, it's quoted at 50 meters per second. Well, that translates out to 180 kilometers per hour. Do we get that in New Zealand? Well, it's not very common, but there have been times when it has dramatically affected us. For example, the Waheni storm. Now during April of 1968, the wind speeds were in excess of 180 kilometers per hour up the Wellington Harbor wreaking havoc not only to the sinking of the Wahine, but on shore as well, seriously damaging a number of buildings. The next live load I want to talk about, and this is particularly relevant to the South Island, is the snow load. Now New Zealand is broken into six separate snow load zones, starting with zone zero at the top half of the North Island, and ending with zone five in the lower end of the South Island. Now what we do to establish our ground snow load is we look at the zone that we're in and we look at the exact altitude of the site. We put that into a formula we get from AS NZS 1170 and we derive what we call our ground snow load. Adjustments are made to this load due to perhaps the roof geometry, roof pitch, building importance level and other factors. 
From there we derive the actual load we use to design that specific building. Well in New Zealand of course we get some large snow loads. And in fact as recently as 2011, the year of the earthquakes for Christchurch, that winter we got two large snowfalls spaced within two weeks of each other. Now to bring that into context, we were designing Christchurch for a snow load of around about a half a metre. And we got that certainly during those two snowstorms. I want to concentrate on a live load now that is actually related to people. So firstly, let's look at what we call a floor live load. It is basically the weight of the number of people that could occupy a building. For example, a residential floor will have a live load of 1.5 kPa, which is actually 150 kilograms per square meter of floor. You will also see here that the balcony load is 2 kPa. Now this recognizes that there is a tendency for more people to gather in a smaller space. Offices and commercial assembly areas have an increase in load as well, taking note of the larger volume of people in the same area. Now the other live load I want to deal with that is related to people is that of the concentrated load or point load. Now this is related generally to the weight of the builder or tradesman doing his either construction work or maintenance. The standard has determined that this load is fixed at 110 kilograms, in other words, the average weight of the builder or tradesman, and is applied to any external part of the structure. This means that as well as the normal design checks we carry out, in other words, our snow loads, our wind loads, our earthquake loads, we need to make sure that the individual structural members are capable of taking this concentrated load. Now once we've established our dead and live loads, we then design using a series of load combinations to satisfy the structural adequacy as required by AS NZS 1170. Now for example, these will be a combination of a wind and a dead load, it could be a combination of a snow and a dead load, or it could be just a dead load only. So in summary, we've established what our dead loads are, what our live loads are, and the various load combinations we have to use, all aimed at deriving what is the most significant or worst load case value, which then becomes the actual load in our formula. Next up, I'm going to cover in Module 3 how we use those loads in specific design options. So don't forget, make sure you look at the rest of our What's It All About series.